All right, welcome to uh, order, order. Please come to order. Thank you. This is uh, Bimi, uh, Bimi, depending on your pronunciation. Um, if that is not your intended destination, uh, this is your last chance. This is the IETF note well, which didn't render too well in the... Uh, <laughs> It, it was faded in the PowerPoint I uploaded, but when they converted it to PDF, apparently that uh, the bit, the uh, gamma didn't quite make it through. Anyway, you've all probably seen the note. Uh, is that better? Yes. Okay, so you've all probably seen the note well elsewhere. Um, check the relevant documents. They all apply. You have the right to remain silent. <laughs> Anything you say can be used by the IETF. You have the right to consult your attorneys about your rights. Yeah. So this is a, a hard to read agenda. <laughs> Yet another slide that didn't render well. The, the kind of usual boff treatment here. So we've got an uh, overview of the problem. We've got some uh, uh, outline of the mechanisms that are required to meet uh, to s solve that problem. Some proposals for how to how to implement those mechanisms, and then some time for discussion at the end. Most of it's going to be driven by these guys here. Um, the questions we're trying to address here, just to kind of get get folks focused on the, on what kind of comments you might be wanting to make. Um, the questions we have here, as a non-working group forming BOF, we're not trying to answer the typical BOF questions. This is more about kind of problem scoping. What problems in this space might be reasonable for the IETF to work on? Which problems are definitely not good problems for the IETF to work on? And where there is that overlap, what, uh, what might be some good points in that space? And to kind of put this in Venn diagram form, because I, you know, IETF folks like math and sets, um, the idea is to kind of, uh, we should be kind of trying to focus on identifying this, this dashed black line here. What is the, the shape of this area of overlap? So the degree in which there's overlap between what uh, BIMI needs and what the IETF works on. And then what are some of these these like squares here? What are some potential good starting points? Uh, so kind of saplings we could be planting to grow into to beautiful uh, technology trees. <laughs> <laughs> Get your money's worth. And so that that's um the chair chair's presentation. Um any any agenda bashes comments before we get started with the, the real content. All right, with that we will uh beam me up over to the uh, presenters. We'll be here all night. <laughs> All right, everybody can hear me? Sorry. <laughs> oh, fantastic. All right, so we're here today to talk about brand indicators for message identification. We call it BIMI. Uh, my name is Alex Brotman, and we're gonna go through some of this in a little bit of phases. Uh, I'll go first, and then there'll be some others following up. So we're gonna go through, this is an overview of what we're gonna talk about. So, uh, or an agenda, I'm sorry. So there's gonna be an overview. We'll talk about some of why we're doing this. Uh, why are we here? Not quite yet, huh? Am I too loud? No, you're just talking in the That's incredible. All right. Um, before you go any further, do you guys want questions in line or do you want us to hold I everybody to the end? I was gonna cover that uh, right here. You have a slide about this? Great. No, 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 no. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, so this presentation is broken into these four sections. Um, we're gonna ask that you try to hold your questions until the end of one, two, three, and then when we get to four. Um, so one will be this overview, uh, some of why we're here and what we're doing, and what we're asking, uh, some current day situations, um, the mechanisms, and then the current proposal. And then we'll have some, a longer discussion. And there are some seats up front still if, you, if you're interested, I don't know. No, okay. So if you look at this today, this appears to be a pretty average email. Um, and this looks like something that I would potentially get in my inbox. Um, and sometimes we can't always tell what's going on. Um, in this particular case, the contact looks legitimate. It looks like a real person. Uh, the content looks good. And unfortunately, even if it passes authentication methods, it has weak policy enforcement. So we wouldn't really be doing anything with the message. It would still potentially go through to the inbox. 
Um, so what we're trying to, so, so in this particular case, uh, the, the customer may be fooled into clicking the link and doing the things they needed, you know, that the attacker is intending. Um, so one of the reasons, or some of the reasons we're doing this is SPF and DKIM and DMARC are all very important. They help with increasing message security. Uh, so the adoption is, is growing, but it's not where we would like it to be. It's not coming along as fast as we would like. And in certain sectors of the industry where it may be more important, it's definitely not where we would like it. So we're potentially going to try to provide an incentive for the, uh, th those, those senders to adopt a stronger DMARC policy, stronger authentication methods so that we can uh, make for a safer ecosystem. So again, we would like stronger authentication. Senders would like some really neat logos. And uh, I'll cover this in a minute, but we also, uh, you guys okay? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, I'll talk about this more in a second, but this already exists in some some state on a several several platforms as it is. So we're going to try to have Bimmy, uh, you know, tie all this together, tie logos to the authenticated messages. Um, so today we ha do have some systems out there that do create tie logos to messages uh, through whatever method. We actually don't know unless you work at that company. So. Today at a receiver, they have uh, some manual systems, they have uh, inconsistent systems, they have uh, where something like if the logo changes, somebody else has to come and update it. It's, it's all on those individual receivers and it's, it's cumbersome. It's, uh, there's, no, there's no clear and consistent way for a receiver to do this today. Uh, and and we can, we've had discussions in the past as a group about some of the ways that, that happens today uh, and we're not really going to go over that today, but it's it's clear that there's there's just it lacks consistency and it's it's not manageable in a, at scale. Um, and so for senders, they sort of have the flip side of the same issue. They they have no control over their logos. So if let's say uh, I were to source a logo today, um, and I and 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 the company that uh, that I'm showing this logo for changes their logo two weeks from now. They have they have to wait for me to do it. There's no way for them to change that today. Uh, so it could be confusing. It could take weeks. It could take months. We don't know. There's no and there's also no control over how the sender's logo is displayed in the platform. They have uh, it, it could be some portion of it. It could be something else. Uh, and there's no there's no the requirements for showing that logo also not known. Um, so more or less we have a bunch of siloed systems that operate independently instead of a cohesive internet scale platform, I guess, or internet scale mechanism. Um, so these are some of the use cases that we sort of see as, as sort of driving Vimy. Uh, so as a sender, you know, I, I'd like to have the customers see my logo. That's a good thing. Those are, uh, you know, they can sort of, uh, the, it's more important, I think, for the senders than it is for, for uh, the receiver, but um, it, it's sort of, again, it's sort of the carrot to help them move along. Um, having a standardized process for each each one of those is good. Um, and then again, having the ability to change the, the logo as they go. I mean, it, it, there's you may have regional logos, you may have seasonal logos. There, there could be things like this that make sense for your organization that you know the this receiver may not be aware of. Um, and then for as a mailbox, I mean, we would love to have more authenticated mail. It helps us have a better ecosystem and help uh, help sort of fight abuse. Um, and again, the, the having the silo systems where each group, each organization does their own validation is really hard. I mean, if, if we've talked to, again, some of the people that do this and they don't, it's, it's you know, somebody's looking at a logo, making sure it's correct, you know, making sure it's in the correct use case, that sort of thing. Uh, and then there's the, the, the last point on there is that some assurances that the senders are you providing logos that are actually theirs. So we have to have a way to ensure that, uh, for instance, if Google is, wants to use a logo, that it is actually Google that is using the proper logo and that they have permission to use that logo um, or any other sender in that case. So uh, you're... All right. Hi, I'm Neil. Next, we want to do is give you sort of a broad overview of what BIMI is. So it's a way to publish, uh, a way to retrieve, 
and a way to validate logos that are attached to a message. The TLDR, the quick set of steps um, that we have encapsulated in BIMI today, is first, the sender needs to implement DMARC. It needs to have a policy of either uh, quarantine or reject. Uh, second, the sender needs to go through some process of validation. There is a method for self-assertion, but we'll talk about that when we get to the validation methods. Third, uh, the sender needs to publish a DNS record pointing to its logo and the method of validation that they used. And from there, mailboxes can retrieve the logo, confirm the form of validation it went through, and decide whether to display it or not. So why do this? For senders, uh, I think Alex covered a lot of it, but it's a standardized way to publish their logos to various receiving platforms. And for mailboxes or receivers, it's a standardized approach to retrieving the logos. So really quickly, just sort of recapping what BIMI is and then right after this, what BIMI is not. Uh, what it is, is an incentive to adopt email authentication. So SPF, DKIM, and DMARC. What it is, is a mechanism for mail senders to suggest to receivers of their email what logo to display alongside the messages. And it is a validation method for a sender to assert that they do have the authority or the, um, uh, the ability to use the logo that they want to display. Quickly talking about what BIMI is not. Uh, this is not a standard that we're trying to position as something that directly uh, increases user trust. So uh, it is not a positive security indicator. It is not an anti-phishing standard in and of itself beyond incenting the adoption of authentication, which we do feel is useful. It is not a method for arbitrary logo, uh, logo display. So the ability to assert any logo from any sender. Uh, so not similar to like a favicon or a gravatar. It's also not a guarantee of logo display. What we mean by that is even if you go through the set of steps necessary to validate a certain publisher logo, uh, we're not making a guarantee that as a receiver, we will display it. Anti-abuse infrastructure will still kick in. If there are things about the message that do not look legitimate, we will uh, not show the logo. And finally, we're trying to position this as something that's not solely about email. The generic problem of wanting to tie a logo to a domain exists in many different places. Uh, and we're hoping that BIM will be able to solve some of their use cases as well. So talking just about a few known implementations of Logo today, uh, some of the larger receivers, Google, Verizon, and Microsoft, all have various forms of Logo display. But as um, Alex was talking about earlier, these things are very fragmented in nature. And as a sender, not only do you have to jump through different hoops for each one of these receivers, you have to jump through other hoops and other places as well. So as we've started to talk to folks uh, about potential adoption, uh, there's a lot of interest that we've seen. From Google's perspective, uh, I think this is a problem that we would like to solve and solve it in a way that applies to everybody. Uh, we're taking a look at the standard and we will adopt it as uh, things go on, uh, assuming they move in sort of a direction that uh, we're comfortable with. Verizon Media is working on an implementation now and we have Srinath on the call who can speak to that as well. There's also a number of other parties that are interested in adoption of BIMI and furthering the standard. So some of the larger ESPs like SendGrid and 250OK, uh, JIPDEC has expressed interest too. And as we've gone through the stages of sort of pilot and uh, having some of the initial documents reviewed, we've seen a lot of other um, you know, interests. And from a sender perspective, there have been a lot of companies that were reached out and it's anecdotal, but this actually seems like it will be something that will help incent off so why are we here? We're here for a few reasons. First, we wanted to make sure that we engage IETF early. A lot of the ideas we're discussing are preliminary ones. They think We think they're the right approach, but we want to get feedback on that, and we want to adapt um, based on that feedback. And we want to do this before we go through and actually implement this at scale. We'd like to seek advice from the IETF community. Um, there's definitely some challenges in the space, and we'll talk about some of those as we move all the way through the presentation. Um, but we want to get advice and figure out how we can uh, tackle these problems in the best way possible. And we want to do this with the goal of ensuring that BIMI is globally accessible. So briefly pausing on some of the common concerns, we're calling them out early in the presentation. We'll be addressing some of these as we talk through the specific mechanics in BIMI, but we wanted to be upfront about some of the larger problems we see uh, to let you know that we're cognizant of them and we are taking a look and seeing how we want to, uh, how we can solve these problems. The first concern that we see is that uh, this may create a web bug that allows for tracking of users, depending on how logos are consumed and displayed and at what points in time they are. Uh, we do see some concern that the use of logos everywhere will turn into maybe a sub-ideal user experience. Um, there <laughs> is concern. Yeah. That senders, that all senders and mailboxes won't be able to use BIMI. So it's something that will only be applicable to larger platforms, and smaller platforms may not have the resources to be able to adopt this. Uh, there's concern that the logos themselves may be a carrier for attacks. And finally, there is a concern that at some point in time, if we go down this path, BIMI will become mandatory for inbox placement. Uh, 
Second, the validation mechanism for figuring out whether somebody actually has rights to a logo is actually not a trivial problem to solve. Uh, the, the different mechanisms we're looking at will require human intervention. There's varying laws around brand imagery around the world, so we have to find a way to consistently tackle that problem. And uh, some of the existing validation systems that we know about, such as EV, are brittle and they're prone to abuse, and we've seen issues with that before. So. Uh, as I said, we'll tackle these concerns as we continue to move throughout, but I just wanted to stop there before we move to the next section to see if there's any initial questions about like the high level overview that we've given. Cool. I'm actually done, but I'll make sure Seth does. So. <laughs> All right. For the people on the Outstanding. So I guess I'm just like, can you go back to, I don't know, three or four slides back um, where you said that there, what you said you're trying to accomplish what what it is but use cases yeah like <sighs> okay so i'm just like trying to understand like so this third point ensure my logo is only used on messages i'm sending right um and then later you say that um it's not a mechanism for fishing but that in fact those are the same thing like, well, let me forget for a second. Sure. Um, like, if, a, if we communicate to the users that the assurance they get is that a logo only appears when it is being sent by an authenticated sender, then they will use that as an anti phishing mechanism. Yes. I think what we're trying to say is that the adoption of DMARC will help from um, a perspective of giving receivers larger reputational signals to hook things on, right? Does that make sense? And I then, don't quite say this response to what I said. <laughs> okay, no, but what I'm saying is from that point onwards, the idea is we don't believe that the presence of an image in front of a user will actually cause them to make better security decisions, but- No, they make worse security decisions yes. than my complaint. Right, <laughs> the presence of an incorrect indicator might. And so what we're trying to bake into the standard is a mechanism for making sure that we're not displaying the wrong logo to a user. No. No, but, but the, 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 okay. The if the user if the user believes they're getting that assurance, mm -hmm. then they will make security decisions on it. And so I, I just I'm not like understanding like how this is not like turning into an anti phishing mechanism under the covers, an allegedly anti phishing mechanism. And okay, well, while you're thinking about that, yes. um, so. Um, uh, can you scroll back to like the, the slide that the, the concerns? Yes. It's like four of these are deal breakers. And do you have any reason to believe you can solve any of them? Yes. <laughs> in, particular, in particular, all the ones about validation, which no one ever ever solved any situation I'm ever familiar with. We think we have some mechanism in place that will help. And so I'd like to hold that question if we can until we get to the validation section. We'll be talking through some of how we're thinking about the problem. And then we can come back to this topic afterwards if that's okay. Sure. And there will be a lot to poke at. Don't, yes. Don't <laughs> uh, sure. Huh? <laughs> Hi, Stephen Farrell. Um, <clears throat> I should start by saying I totally hate this idea. Um, <laughs> so, if you go back, you don't need to go back to the slides, but I didn't actually see any. But you, you or Alex mentioned a problem. I heard you say things you'd like to do. And then going back to Richard's slides, I, 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 you, your slide with the nice Venn diagram, it made me wonder what's the shape of the null set? Uh, you're looking for problems and I'm not seeing problems other than, so can you articulate what the problem is as opposed to what the opportunity for marketing is? Yes, I think one of the things that we're starting with is the fact that logo display is sort of a thing in the ecosystem today. A lot of receivers have systems in place already that do this, but do this in a very fragmented and non-standard method and that makes it harder for senders to go through these various processes and uh, do them one by one in a scalable fashion. So that's sort of one problem. 
And the second problem that we're trying to solve from a receiver standpoint is, as Alex mentioned, we have not seen the adoption of DMARC at sort of the scale and the velocity at which we'd like. So one of the things we're trying to do is figure out how we create an incentive to move that along quicker. Okay, so, and okay, in the first one, people have problems doing their marketing more thoroughly, fair enough. Yep. Um, I'm not clear on the logic in the second one, how displaying a logo is gonna have anything to do with DMARC adoption, but okay. So that's, that's one thing. I think also the top line there, the web bug, I mean, that's just horrendous. Um, yes. You know, it's bad enough that you get it when you open the mail, but before you open the mail, and it seems to imply from my reading of the documents that the only way to avoid this is for my MTA to kind of screw it up first, which seems architecturally just kind of not very nice at all. So caching specifically is something we'll address. I think uh, Seth said there's a lot to poke with validation, but I think there's some things that we'll talk about. With, right, but the caching assumption yeah. means that an unmodified MTA, yes. which is the default, is the privacy worst case. An unmodified MTA wouldn't be able to do this? So an unmodified MTA will still get the mail to me, right? Right. But and then my user agent would go and follow the link. Well, no, that, that, that wouldn't yeah. happen. Well, in that case, your, your documents don't explain any, how, you get a, how you get a link dereferenced. No, that's a, that's a fair point. But when we get through how the process works, I think we'll, we will address that. I'll come back. Okay, cool. <laughs> Yeah, Yariako Erickson. Um, so this may might actually be clear uh, later, but I just want to provide one piece of feedback here that during this discussion, I at least had a problem with the terminology of, of validation because I actually see two different issues here. One, one is to make sure that your domain actually intended to use a particular uh, logo and, 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 and file reference and whatnot. Um, and so, so that, that's one thing that, that that's relatively easily solvable. The other problem is to make sure that other people don't use something that looks like your yep. your logo. So making that distinction clear and understanding what we use for one and the other is, is key. Yes. Wes Hertiker, ISI. Um, so I'll come back later when we get to the security part, but the, your third bullet here really strikes at the core of how the IETF works, which is that we try not to create protocols and pieces of the internet architecture that favor uh, one segment over another, especially large segments over small segments. And <laughs> bless you. <laughs> um, and so I, I would seriously consider uh, rescoping so that that we try to be inclusive as possible with the entire ecosystem. Yeah, go ahead. So, I mean, I think for, for I think all of us sort of have the goal to make this as accessible as possible. This is a concern that's been stated to us, and we're trying to do our best to make sure that this is accessible to large and small senders. Because we understand, I mean, when we first discussed this with people outside of our group, that was one of the first things we heard was how, you know, how does this impact small senders and small receivers? So we definitely want to take that into consideration. We, this is sort of one of the things that we also need help with. Um, we have some ideas and we're hoping that it works out for everybody, but not, uh, again, it's just something that has come up more than once. So, so, so. Should, should we I'll let Dave? Yeah, I'll let Dave go. Dave, you're uh, enabled. But, so this is working, yes? Yes, we yeah. can hear you. You could have lied. Oh, cool. Um, so <laughs> the, the, the beginning of the presentation, <clears throat> excuse me, the beginning of the presentation um, included a statement that uh, this would or should improve user behavior uh, to not click on invalid stuff. Um, and and yet the, there seems to be some claim that that's not actually a goal. Uh, I mean, there was a slide that showed a, um, a, a an image of a message that could have been construed as uh, phishing. Is that what's the one you're talking about? Yep. I'm, I'm, okay. Um, I mean, w I was more trying to show that the the this uh, the message had weak. Uh, um, authentication, um, not so much that it, uh, I mean, it's it's still ultimately up to the receiver, you know, is the message spam? How do we interpret the signals that we get for those messages? 
I mean, I, we were just showing it as it looks plausible. I didn't, you know, I can't say for certain if that would have been spam or not at Microsoft.com. So there's absolutely nothing in uh, any of the existing email authentication standards <clears throat> that would affect the decision making of that example. If it had, so I think when I said it had uh, potentially failed both SPF and DKIM and had weak policy enforcement, based on what I showed you, you couldn't see if it had failed, but even if it had, we couldn't have done anything about it. So, so I apologize. I didn't hear uh, when you were when you were doing that slide. I hadn't heard the references to having failed um, uh, SPF or DKIM. <coughs> okay. I, I, I suspect others might have missed that also. I, I do apologize because the uh, again the focus of what I heard, and I believe that this is a continuing issue with the way BME is presented, is um, that it sets an expectation for improved receiver, sorry, recipient behavior. Uh, that's something explicitly we're trying not to state. Uh, we have, uh, I don't know, how, I mean, our goals really involve uh, driving, you know, authentication for messages. That's an, an increased messaging security in that way. I mean, so, we, we, we've had those. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. We, we have, and we're in a new venue with lots of new people. So unfortunately, we get to rehash some of these things. Um, <laughs> so the, the, the value proposition, uh, I think, is pretty simple uh, that, that BME is offering and would encourage you, to the extent that what I'm about to say doesn't quite match, I'd encourage you to um, uh, formulate and constantly use uh, the value proposition in short form that uh, is accurate. Uh, my simplistic summary, uh, some creators of email want to get their logo displayed to recipients. Companies like uh, brand impressions, and that term is used in the overview document. Uh, they like to get brand impressions. It is hoped that some, uh, th that some expectation of getting logos displayed in a privileged location will incentivize these creators to adopt mail transport authentication standards. That's that's way more verbose than one would like, but it's what I ended up typing uh, into the chat window. Mm. Oh, unfortunately, I don't think we can see that, but okay. It's in the chatter. Okay. Well, that, that's why I read it out loud. Was okay. <laughs> and, that was a you, lot, though. I mean, you, you, it, it is a lot, but basically, <laughs> there's folks that want their logo displayed, and it's hoped that giving them some expectation, but not a promise, will cause them to adopt uh, uh, some email authentication standards. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As I put it to some folks this week, it is the dessert to get people to eat their demarked vegetables. <laughs> Okay, one more, and then we're going to move to the next section. We'll come back. Uh, yes. Okay, let me go. Okay, Florian Streibert, MPI. Um, just maybe a strange question, but how are, for example, blind people supposed to check these logos? And if you have to get an alternate way to display, well, this sender has been verified, shouldn't a green mark that this domain has been verified be enough? And if brands want to show their brand, they should just use same domain names that are related to their brand and not some random from address that's some CDN like mass mailer? Um, well, no, I, I, I mean, I, I unfortunately don't know enough about accessibility. I don't know if that's something you could do with an alt tag or something like that embedded in, go ahead. Oh, they, apparently they've already discussed it, talked about it and I'm not. Well, we'll mention later on um, an optional capability to describe a, a name associated with that logo um, later on. The, the one other thing I'd say to that point is we've talked about other things that could be transmitted along with this, but if we can't solve the logo use case, then the other use case is sort of melt away. And if we can solve it, then we would love to do more. Um, the only thing I want to ask before we move on is I think we have one of the last questions was actually, will this actually help in sent off? And I think we have someone on who can speak to that for a second. Um, I don't know if you want to move on. Um, 
Kurt from Send Grizzle, he's actually been working with people who have been having trouble getting auth in place and saying, hey, there's this thing being discussed called BIMI, you need auth to, to actually get BIMI, has helped them start the process of getting SPF DKIM and DMARC in place. And so if you want to hear it, I'd ask him to speak. Otherwise, we can continue yes, on. If he, if he joins the queue, we'll enable him. Kurt, could you join the queue? Because, <laughs> please. Yeah, Kurt, if you can join the queue uh, through Medico, I can uh, hit a button and let you project yeah. into the room. And if not, we can come back to him later, or we'll have him share some uh, stories with the mailing list. OK, it looks like it looks like maybe we should go on. So we want to chat about how do we make BIMI work, right? How would how do we take an industry that wants to incent off users who want to display logos and how do we get them to the right place? How do, how do we connect the dots and do the right thing so we don't have uh, fraudulent use of logos? And, and so to do that, there are basically five things. You have to be able to as a domain, assert your logo. You need to actually be able to say, yes, this logo is valid, and we're going to have lots of conversation points there. <laughs> um, and then as on the receiving side, you have to consume it. And then we'd also like to make sure there's some reporting component to this, and we need a way to fix problems in the ecosystem when the wrong things happen. And I'm going to go through this relatively quickly, because I think if we dive into all the details, we'll be here forever. Um, but basically, there are four primary ways we've looked at for publishing a logo. I'm a domain, and I want you to know what I want to use, right? So you can put it in a message header field like Xface. Uh, you could attach it to a message something like SMIME. Uh, you could use a mechanism like Vouch by Reference, or you can publish this in the DNS uh, in the same way as DKIM, DMARC, and SPF are currently done. There's a host of concerns here on each one. Uh, I'm not going to dig into this unless anyone wants to talk about specific uh, pros or cons of these. Um, you're looking confused. Would you like me to talk to them? Well, most of these seem like self-assertions. Yes. So uh, the, the comment from Ecker was most of these seems like self-assertions. And so that is the next slide of how do we validate these and how does it work. And the self-assertion corner is uh, there for a reason. <laughs> oh, it's, it's hidden by me. Uh, so after a logo has been published, right, you have to get it validated, right? This, this doesn't work without validation. It just turns into, hey, this is me, and that's fishing bonanza territory for everyone, right? And so there are a few ways to do this, right? The, the least scalable way is, hey, if you have a reputation system, you can just leverage your reputation system to display a logo. And that works if you're a few of the big people and doesn't work for anyone else. Uh, and so it's a place where things could be started and tested, but it's not a place where we want this to end up. Right? Then there are existing registries, uh, dot .bank, um, the organizations that have members who can say, hey, these are valid domains. We know they're good. And if they self-assert, the logo is good. And that also has a really, really high bar for participation. The next way, the, the way that we think gets most of the domains possible is some sort of third party validation where a sender would basically come say, this is my logo. And the third party would go through um, a checklist and basically go through and do diligence on the logo, on the entity requesting it, on the person requesting it, and come out with an attestation saying, we're willing to put our reputation as a third party on the line, and we believe this logo is legitimate, and provide a remediation loop. And the final method here is someone to self-attest, right? And say, hey, this is my domain, and it doesn't even need anyone else. That's broadly adoptable. That's also just the security and sanity. So we're going to dig into how we believe this should go in the next section. But right now, right, validation is a required mechanism of BIMI, and we have to do this. And we believe these are the routes on the table to, to do validation. Next, the, a validated logo has to be consumed. So a mail system, make sure authentication is in place. 
make sure the BIMI record is valid, checks the validation mechanism against the logo that's been provided, and can say, great, I want, I'm ready to use this logo. I believe it's good. They'd retrieve it, they'd cache it. Caching it is critical to avoid the web bug problem. Uh, and then they could display it when a message is received based on their own policy and their own signals about the message. I think this is probably the most straightforward slide in the entire presentation. <laughs> um, one thing that's missing today is any sort of reporting or feedback loop uh, from customers um, and pe brands that have been interested in uh, implementing BIMI. They all want to know its efficacy and same as with DMARC, when a DMARC report is used to say, where are things not authenticated? We're looking at this primarily as a mechanism to say, okay, well, I'm using BIMI, but it's not working here. Oh, here's why. It's an invalid record. It didn't validate. Something's been corrupt in the flow, and you can go figure it, figure it out. But specifically, we don't want reporting to be about, here's how many messages were displayed. It can't be used as a web, web bug. And it can't say it can't be a signal to spammers to say, "Hey, oh, I'm able to use a BIMI report to figure out what got delivered." And then finally, we think BIMI needs a remediation mechanism. And to be perfectly frank, we really don't have a meaningful clue as to how this is going to work, right? Uh, I think we know remediation systems at scale for things like this just haven't historically worked. And the question is. This makes sense to have, right? If a if a large receiver sees, oh, we figured out that this domain is using a fraudulent logo and wants to yank it, everyone should get that benefit. And the flip side, if a small a smaller receiver in a region that many people don't see figures out something is fraudulent, that domain shouldn't be able to use their logo anywhere else in the world either. And so, just in general, the fifty thousand foot level about these mechanisms? Are there any uh, comments or questions? Hi, Stephen Farrell. So mm -hmm. can you go back a couple of slides? Um, sure. To the one to, to, uh, forward, forward, forward. Yeah. Okay. So again, so imagine I have an unmodified MTA and a mm -hmm. main user agent that knows about BIMI. Mm -hmm. What happens? So in the proposal we're talking about basically the way this works is the MTA then adds a header to the message. No, no, so, so the receiver's MTA is unmodified. So then nothing works because BIMI's never been validated, logo's never been retrieved and no, cached. No, no, sorry, unmodified for BIMI. It knows how to do DMARC, it knows how to do SPF. So mm -hmm. your, your second scenario is the MTA is unmodified, but the uh, mail user agent is modified to do BIMI. Correct. So. One of the things we believe is required here is the MTA needs to say, I have done BIMI validation, and here is a logo that you pull from me that's been cached that you're allowed to use. You would never pull from the actual source in a BIMI record. And how would the user agent know that? So th there, there is a whole bunch of uh, content in the draft we've written for that, and we don't love it. So the answer is that that still needs some work. Uh, the, there was a proposal for like an IMAP flag where, flag where you could stick something in the message and say, hey, there's a BIMI bit on this, and then any mailbox could consume it and display it. And your expectation is that MUA developers wouldn't just go ahead and dereference a URL. That's why we don't love it. <laughs> okay. So I, so I think any yeah. claim that there's no web bug is, is un, untrue from okay. my reading of that situation. Well, or, at least, like careful scoping of what an MU, you know, clear mm -hmm. advice to what MUAs should and should not do here would be necessary to avoid mm -hmm. it, right? Like you could say MUA must not do whatever. Well, there's, what's there's the a, number of that ROC again? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Jim, I think we'll let Dave. Uh, I think Dave was just ahead of you in the queue. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, so the term validated logo is um, really foundational and getting used a lot. Um, mm -hmm. It is not really made clear exactly what that means and what it doesn't, because it could mean many, many different things. Mm -hmm. you're, you're absolutely correct. And so in the next section, we dig into what we have and where it works and where it doesn't. Um, but you're right, having a validated logo and knowing definitively what that means is the core of this because you can't display anything if, if you don't understand those bounds. Dave, did I address yeah, the question? Yeah, thanks. Okay. 
Hi, Jim Fenton. Um, I certainly understand the role of SPF and DKIM validation here. Uh, I'm wondering what the role of DMARC is in, in setting this up. I, I guess you need to establish a binding to the from address of the message, which SPF mm -hmm. and DKIM lack. Correct. But in order to do that, do you actually need to have a DMARC record? Or do you simply say in this specification that SPF and DKIM have to, uh, have to correspond to the from address? So we're specifically trying to incentivize SPF, DKIM, and DMARC. But, um, but, if there's, but if there's no actual requirement for publishing a DMARC record to do that, I think that's kind of just, um, I think it's fraudulent. Not certain I understand your point. Well, there are domains for which publishing what some people would consider a meaningful DMARC record mm -hmm. is really, I mean, they can't publish that policy because it isn't true. And so um, authenticating the message, making mm -hmm. sure that it corresponds to the from address, mm -hmm. I understand how that, how that would be a, a prerequisite to doing anything with BIMI. But I don't understand why actually publishing a DMARC policy is required in order to do that. And I think that if you simply set it up as an incentive, it, it's there isn't a technical reason to do that. I don't I don't see how you can how you can legitimately say that you need a DMARC record in order to accomplish this. So I think one and I don't have a great answer for you to start, um, but I think one of the reasons that's been meaningful to me is DMARC, especially at an organizational domain level, says you can't spoof a user using any from domain anchored to this org domain, right? And with that, the way the current mechanism works is I can publish a BIMI record that is now applicable to any mail that authenticates from this system. And the DMARC record means I've done the hard work of putting the security in place to make sure I'm only sending authenticated mail, and then only that authenticated mail will get a logo. And without well, the DMARC record, only only authenticated mail will get a logo anyway. Because if it if it isn't authenticated, then then BIMI just doesn't happen. Right. Yeah. And and you don't need the record to say mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And your 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 point is well taken. And I, I'm trying to say a, a stronger thing about DMARC, but that's also. That's absolutely a fair question for people to talk about. So I think mm -hmm. I want to step back from the mechanism mm -hmm. for a minute because I want to stipulate that it's certainly possible. There's only we certainly can make invent some shit that will like mm -hmm. it, that, will, that will like if we assume that there's like we have a way of constructing a binding between like sending domain names and logos. So I'm certain we can invent some mechanism for like the receiver to like display those logos when it when it convinces itself that the that they came from the domain name. I mean, like mm -hmm. I can imagine a number of ways to do that. Um, so I'm like not particularly concerned. Like now, those may be awesome or they may be sucky, but I'm pretty confident that they can be achieved. Mm -hmm. um, the, the part I'm like still sort of struggling with, honestly, is the part that like I just sort of stipulated, which is how we create that binding. Mm -hmm. um, and like, I guess I'm just not finding the story you're offering me particularly persuasive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, like Slack has had like three different logos in the past like three months. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, so like, I mean, really like, and it's like, I, I, and like, and like, it's very, very common to see logos which are, which are, which are look very much like each other. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, like, certainly I agree. It's like unlikely that I'll be able to register Coca-Cola, something like Coca-Cola. But like for anything, anything in the long tail, I'm just like I'm really not following how you believe you have a mechanism that will stop um, uh, that will stop that. And it seems to me we have several worked examples of this. Um, mm -hmm. We have logo types in um, certificates were completely failed, um, mm -hmm. and we have EV where it's been like proven very very easy to get um, you know for basically anything long tail to get to get names that match up, right? Mm -hmm. And so e despite the fact that EV alleged that EV is a much simpler system with a much simpler like name ma with a much simpler matching algorithm, and um, you know. Um, and like, uh, and, and so like, like, tell, like, help me feel better about this. Like, mm -hmm. help me understand like why this is going to work. So first of all, it's a very important point, especially about the attacks on EVs. We actually have a couple of slides about those attacks and how we think we have addressed some of them. But part of the reason we're here is we're not thrilled with our story. We think we've solved, we, there's a big surface area and we have part of it solved in a corner that we don't think is big enough 
and we need help there to expand this and make this more applicable. Sure, I guess, I guess so. This is not something IETF does well. Um, you know, um, I mean, this is this is a social. I mean, it's like like again, like I'm quite confident that if you gave me like an oracle which like mapped domain names to like the logos, I could deliver like the logos onto the screen. Um, and that's something we do quite well. Well, maybe <laughs> allegedly we do well. Um, but um, but like the thing we don't don't do well is because our system is for like dealing with like real world identities. Quite the contrary, like in the in the again far simpler case of just validating that people have certificates that match the domain names have actually been issued when it's like actually memcomp. You know, we like punt that off to like you know, other people, right? Um, so, um, you know, I, I guess I'm just like, like if, it feels to me like if, if you think we're going to solve that problem for you, you have like real big problems because we're like not going to. So, yeah, I, I think that to summarize, I think the data point here is that there are mechanisms, you know, policy mechanisms, valid, you know, mm -hmm. definitional questions about you know, what this validation is that will probably be worked out outside of the IETF. I mean, mm -hmm. the analogy I think everyone's making to the cab form rules around DV, mm -hmm. um, right? So there may be something necessary there. Uh, and so like that's maybe in that slice of the, the, the BIMI part of the Venn diagram that was outside the mm -hmm. IETF. No, that's exactly right. Like there, there are many things about validation we don't think we can solve at the IETF. I think that's actually part of the final slide here is is what what we think is work to be done here and what we think isn't. But there are also many things that influence that where we don't know what we don't know. And the ITF is a repository of knowledge of what's failed here and what we need to take into account as, as we dig in. So um, um, after the gentleman in the red shirt, we're gonna move to the next section. We have, you have, you're on slide 19 of 45 and we are just under an hour done. So I wanna make sure you get through everything. Ron Gondwana, I was about to backseat chair and basically say that the answer to most of the questions here have been, there's slides about this in the future. How about we actually see the slides rather than asking questions that are just gonna be answered. There's more slides because that's a waste of everybody's time. I wanted to answer one specific thing about a web bug in a client and the idea that if you have a client that supports BIMI and yet doesn't understand about the fact that the server doesn't support BIMI, it might display the image well, sure, but it will, might display random URLs from the HTML content as well. If you've got a client that's fetching random URLs and isn't following the spec, no spec is gonna protect against that. So that's not a realistic threat model. It's a much better answer than I had. <laughs> Wes Herdiker, ISA. So users are funny. Um, <laughs> Good user, good user. <laughs> they they latch onto things, right? So if they start seeing a icon in a corner and it's you know privileged or whatever, um, they start believing that icon no matter where it exists. Uh, they prefer it over text. That's actually why uh, we're much better at recognizing icons than we are at looking the text underneath the app on my phone. Um, I don't go read every single word when I'm looking for an app. I look for the icon. So the instant they see it, they begin to you know think that it's valid. So I'll echo ecker, I'll echo what a lot of ecker said, uh, which is that there's some severe binding issues here because the reality is is that though you stated that the use case is not to promote authentication to the user, there's a bunch of missing pieces, and you're giving the context to the user that hey, this might actually be validated. So if I create a very short header message and then add the logo right before it, right below it users will likely be confused. Um, and it may not have even come from anywhere near the same domain. The The URL itself is pulled from uh, a DNS URL and yet DNSSEC isn't mentioned anywhere. So that's possible, you know, a point of attack. Um, there's no incentive for the MTA not to just include the picture without actually checking the validation because, you know, why would they go through the trouble if they're like a, a cheaper startup that just wants to display a logo, right? Um, they can just go pull it. There's no incentive on that side. So there seems to be a, a uh, you know, you're trying to create a carrot for large businesses to display a logo and advertising it as a security solution with a decent amount of holes in it. So, but thank you for the feedback. I um, I don't know if you want me to address everything you said now, but those 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 are important points. And I think we have answers for some of them and bad answers for others. 
like <clears throat> Stefan Sanson, AAA Security, mm-hmm. as, as one of the authors of the X509 logo mm-hmm. type stuff. Uh, I've given logo types quite a number of thoughts in security protocols, and a lot of this discussion is a little bit of a deja vu. Um, a little bit of what? <laughs> deja vu. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry for the pronunciation. Mm-hmm. But <clears throat> so logo types are extremely powerful tools for human and human recognition, much better than text. That's what mm-hmm. makes them very powerful, but also very dangerous. Uh, so one thing about validated logos is I, that I truly think that no such thing exists. But what I do think exists is claimed logo from validated entities. Mm-hmm. So we can have validated entities who we know who they are and we can nail them if they act dishonestly. And we can document what they are claiming to be a representation of their, them and their brand. And that might actually be very good enough for a lot of applications. So that is the point I would like to make. I think you've just given Waze part of the presentation for him. All right, <laughs> let's go to the next section. So before we give the current proposal, uh, let's start with a couple of things that we know are, are still really problematic. First one is that the, the group of us that put this proposal together, we represent mostly larger US companies and there's just an inherent bias in how we thought of this. We, we believe we're well represented uh, downstream of that, but we're looking for feedback. We're looking for awareness. We don't know what we don't know here. Um, also, we haven't solved the problem of automating logo validation. It still requires a human or, or some organization made up of humans to do the validation themselves and that organization is gonna be failable in certain instances. Uh, finally, even if we don't trust the self-attested logo, you still have to determine who you trust, which third parties do I trust, for instance. And so we still have, you still have to pick and choose. Um, also to, I think the point that Ecker was making before, uh, lookalike logos, especially in the long tail are our problem. We have not solved that yet. And, and finally, this has come up a few times, but if you don't cache logos, there is a definite web bug and that is a problem with the current solution for sure. Um, so there's a, a document for this current proposal. There's actually two, there's this one and a guidance document. Um, the current proposal says, takes DNS publishing of a record. It's really straightforward. It's got a location of uh, the image and then a validation meca- mechanism attached. And you basically say that the hash that come out of the validation meca- mechanism match the hash of the logo. And if so, you know it's the same logo that's been validated and you can go ahead and display it. Uh, and the way validation works uh, is either, uh, and Wei's gonna talk about this in a minute, either we have certificates and CAs or we have a JSON web token API. And there is a self-attestation mechanism uh, for testing, for monitoring, for understanding if you're deploying things correctly, for for putting your logo forward before validation is complete. Um, There are a couple of people who may have reputation systems or whitelists who are confident they can display these, but in general, this is a terrible idea and a huge, huge security problem. So you shouldn't use self-attested logos, especially if you've just got your own mail system. So I'm gonna hand off to Wade to talk about validation and how we do attestations of logos. Thank you, Wei. All right, hopefully you can all hear me. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the uh, third party method to uh, do these sort of attestations, talk about some of the validations and basically try to say you know, why we're doing uh, this particular method and also we're trying to, I want to point out that there's actually a number of questions that need to be answered uh, in this. And you know, we'd love help from the ITF community on how to um, get better answers for uh, these things. So what are some of the things that we would like from this uh, third party uh, validation process? And you know, some of the these things are that you know, there is some sort of entity that could, for example, own things like a logo that you know, it's going to be this legal entity capable of owning a logo, that that entity can uh, control things like a domain name, and that uh, there is some individual that can basically authorize the use of 
uh, or the, the creation of these bindings between the domain and the logo uh, and, and you know uh, have a validation process that uh, can make sure that that individual is uh, who he is or she say say she uh, is and put that into um, some place where you know we can find out about that later on if we need to so here there's actually you know um, I'm, I'm posing that there's sort of two different methods for doing these sort of attestations of this validation. Um, you know, there's this traditional X509 uh, certificate uh, that's going to be, um, you know, using a trust model, a CA-based trust model. Um, and then this other, this JSON web token, that's going to be passed through via an API. Um, and that we have a question. So we, we, you know, we were originally doing our design based on X509. And hence, you'll see a lot of our documentation is based on that assumption of X509. We re recently been, um, you know, we were informed about JSON Web Token. There's another possibility that, you know, it may help us particularly create, you know, short-lived attestations that may help with things like revocation. So other differences are, you know, of course, X509 is based on ASN.1, not a particularly friendly format to work with, whereas, you know, of course, uh, JWTs are are using JSON, which is a very popular format. Um, however, there's also other very important differences, of course, uh, X509 has things like, um, you know, because it's more mature, it's well established, it has um, good uh, references for things like governance, like how we go about doing these sort of validations. You know, extended validation can be a model that we build upon and use uh, and extend. Similarly, you know, things that we need for uh, long-term security, you know, such as having audits in place, uh, standards about doing those types of audits, those exist over in X509. They do not exist in JWT. And then that would be something that would have to be stood up in order to effectively use them in a secure way. Um, so as mentioned, you know, X509, typically those certificates tend to be long-lived. Of course, there's, you know, recent work on short-lived certificates here at the ITF, um, there's uh, well understood uh, standards for certificate revocation lists. Um, these are, you know, they have a lot of benefits if you use long list certificates, but they're downsides because that's one of these scalability problems that may particularly impact, say, smaller receivers um, that don't have the capabilities to work with things like, you know, these uh, CRLs. And uh, certificates also bring with it some um, transparency mechanisms that are a good way of identifying after you, you've detected a problem, helping scope that problem in, in the, the certificate system. Um, you know, that's been something that's been out there for a while. For JWTs, um, there's no such thing that, as far as I know, that has uh, been uh, specified. And that also is some other work that would have to be done. Uh, and that also brings some additional complexity. Ben Campbell, I have a question on your thoughts around short-lived certificates. If there's a better time to ask it, I can wait. It probably is better to hold up as possible, but you'd be at the head of the queue, okay. I think. Is that, sure? is that okay? Okay. <clears throat> okay, so um, so certificates bring with it some well-known problem, particularly you know coming from the web EV world. It's been around for a long time. Um, it's been basically attacked a bunch of times, and this is, you know, um, acknowledgement of some of those types of attacks that we're aware of them. Um, you know, for example, a lot of, there's a lot of edge cases about the notion of identity and, you know, how those edge cases can be basically misused to attack um, um, users. So, you know, two, two examples right here. Um, first, a security researcher, Ian Carroll, like demonstrated that it wasn't very hard actually to use jurisdictional concerns as a way of of going after um, this notion of identity. So Stripe Inc. of Delaware is a well-known uh, credit card processor. He was able to um, basically create a shell company in Kentucky and basically get himself a valid EV certificate, at least for a while, valid. Um, and then um, another researcher, James Carroll, basically was able to create another company um, just called Identity Verified. And then a user seeing Identity Verified might just assume, yes, this you know website was verified. Um, and that would be misleading. 
Also, there's a number of problems about um, misissuance, uh, basically intentional or mistaken by, by um, certain CAs. So, for example, you know, Symantec um, issued a number of test certificates for Google.com. There are other examples, like um, I guess an Egyptian CA was also doing um, going after Google.com, and um, that's because of poor governance, because that was a registration authority chained through a number of steps, forget how many steps, I mean, you know, it was a sub-CA, sub-CA, and so forth, but basically uh, they still had the power to basically issue for any arbitrary entity they wanted to. So what do we want from these attestations, um, you know, and, you know, how, what are the things that are going to be contained in these attestations to help um, a, a receiver understand what it is that it's looking at? So these um, attestations are going to carry first a notion of, you know, what was this uh, trusted party that did the validation, this notion of a trusted root anchor. And so the, the, re the receiver is going to have to make some sort of determination which particular set of um, trusted uh, validators is going to use. So that's, you know, um, then the, the test, a testing token or certificate is going to have to have a number of things describing what it is that it has uh, validated. Um, and these are things like, you know, what is that legal entity uh, that uh, is going to have the, the rights to that logo or, or potentially also name? Uh, it's also going to um, have a binding to uh, domain names associated with that that particular logo and or name. And um, in addition, you know, with that validation, there needs to be some sort of uh, metadata or records that uh, speak to how that validation was done, who it was that was the um, subscriber that authorized that uh, validation and uh, creation of that attestation. So what we propose to use for a uh, basis for um, working with these trademarks, and, and this is to that point about um, what, what it is that uh, is, is, you know, the basis for a, a valid uh, validation is use of a registered trademarks, right? Because what it provides is a useful and in some sense legally correct means to, to um, uh, say who owns that logo, um, you know, it has logos, of course, as part of the registration. It provides a set of standards for doing, um, you know, th things like uh, determining, you know, what, what are the different things, you know, comparing basically the logo to other things. It also provides things like, you know, public records that can be used for that validation and also uh, even having things like a review process to ensure uh, that, uh, you know, other things out there aren't going to conflict with that identity. So there's this notion, I mean, in, in registered trademarks of basically, you know, proving that it's not going to be confusable with some other other logo. There's a, a legal test in the trademark process, uh, registration process called likelihood of confusion tests. And that's one of the things that uh, can be helpful in preventing some of the potential attacks, basically. It also provides a uh, means for, um, in that uh, review process, of at least, you know, removing things like objectionable and misleading content. Of course, you know, with strong caveats as to, you know, how, how good those tests are. And of course, it provides means if there is some sort of conflict, you know, a, a process by which, you know, uh, at least in the legal sense, a remedy can be applied through an adjudication process. So the logo types, um, what's proposed is at least, and this is basing largely on what was done in X509, there's uh, two RFCs about uh, logo types, uh, RFC, you know, 3709, as well as uh, 6170 that helps specify, you know, what we uh, propose to use. And what we propose to use for at least the logo um, format is SVG. And in order to secure it, we need to use a particular profile. First, you know, the SVG tiny profile uh, is targeted at uh, low memory footprint um, uh, clients. 
And it also cannot, uh, you know, have script tags, you know, we want to prevent XSS. We also want to make sure that it can't pull in things like, you know, potentially uh, new content, which would create a web bug, but also may also would have been, could have been a avenue for, for um, more script, uh, JavaScript. We also want to make sure that this logo type isn't associated to a particular jurisdiction that says where it's going to be valid. Um, and um, we want there to be a, a name uh, associated, you know, it's optional, but what it would speak to is, as was noted before, this is a, a way of, um, you know, answering that question about accessibility. So, um, you know, blind users could potentially uh, have an identity that they could understand. Um, and then also one of the open questions with this is basically, you know, what to do about, you know, multiple jurisdictions. So when, you know, a sender sends out a message, they may not know where that uh, message ends up in. And then, so how, right now the, the current spec that we've, we've published um, basically only allows for one um, logo and name. Potentially this is a problem for localization um, and that's an open, how we do that is an open question. So going back to that, you know, some of the um, EV type attacks and then maybe some of the remediations that this particular process may provide, um, you know, first for like, you know, Stripe Inc of Delaware versus Kentucky, um, you know, first off, uh, one of course is, you know, state versus national level, but actually really what it is is saying that, okay, these things are only gonna be valid for a particular um, jurisdiction. And, um, you know, part of the process would be to, to um, uh, put that information in and, and have clients use it. Then what we also could do is, um, you know, if since we propose that it's a really good idea to have some sort of transparency mechanism as part of this process. Um, and that we could consider that this transparency process may even provide a means by um, having a review period during issuance that may help with some of these problems. Now that, you know, having having review period as part of issuance is a new thing that, that you know, hasn't been specified, um, but, you know, it's a concept that um, I think has been thought about before. It's one that we think could be really helpful and uh, particularly for these types of identities. Going to the identity verified case, um, you know, so we note that uh, the registration process um, is, is meant to also filter out, you know, misleading indicators and names, you know, potentially that review process may have caught something like identity verified, you know, possibly. And again, you know, tr things like transparency, uh, potentially with a, you know, that preview process could be helpful in, in mitigating or certainly scoping out um, uh, identity attacks like that. And then with regards to uh, misissuance, uh, intentional or unintentional, that again, you know, is, is something that perhaps is best addressed by some sort of transparency mechanism. Um, there is one more slide and then a break, so then we'll start the line, just so you're wondering. Um, okay, so uh, certificate transparency. Um, so certificate transparency, uh, you know, RFC 6962, um, is a mechanism by which, you know, what, what it allows the ecosystem to have is some sort of way of getting a global view of the ecosystem. And that's particularly helpful in finding a scope of a particular problem once when it's found. It is, it is of course, a retrospective uh, technique. Um, it does not uh, mitigate misissuance though. And that's something to keep in mind. Um, what we propose, at least in certainly the certificate model is that there ought there, there has to be a um, uh, basically a SCT extension in, in the certificate. One of the issues that we've recently come across is a concern that, okay, so these, these trademarks, they have legal properties attached to them. Um, they also may contain content that is very problematic. Um, potentially that very problematic content may be checked during the registration process but it may be missed, particularly by a very um, insecure, in some sense, uh, issuer, or maybe intentionally attacked. Um, that would be a problem. Uh, and then 
you know, what to do about when this trademark material has either expired or um, due to some court order has changed basically ownership. And what if that new owner wants to basically, you know, remove that content? Um, it's, it's potentially, a, it is simply a difficult uh, problem. And, you know, how do we, how do we solve that? Um, that that's, a, in some sense, it's been, I believe I've heard it's been a, a problem that's been thought quite a bit about in the, you know, the CT community. Um, but I think it'll be, you know, become more of, a, much more of a pressing problem if when, if and when we start doing these uh, trademarks inside the certificates. And lastly, if we go down the road of, of doing token transparency, which are going to be short-lived, um, especially very short-lived tokens, what happens when we have to log all the tokens? There are already scaling issues inside certificate transparencies. This would definitely amplify how do we solve those types of problems. Okay, so I guess. Go ahead. You've only got one slide left. Yeah, this one. Okay. That's fine. And then we'll call everyone. We're, we're up almost here at the end, and then we've got a giant discussion section. Yes. So. Uh, yeah. So. So this is the, 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 our, our final wrap up of the scary problems that still remain even after all this is we haven't solved the lookalike indicator on a lookalike domain problem. Um, and that's, that's obviously an issue, but that's still a problem that exists today. It's not a, it's not a new problem that's being created, but it's, it's not a fun one. Uh, then there's also for those, Similar ones like PayPal versus Pandora comes up all the time when you talk about logos, uh, but that's not a phishing vector. They're not going to uh, attack each other unless one of them screws up their auth, and then someone can use bad auth on one to attack the other. Um, so that we want to open up to everything. Uh, so if I can have everyone join me up here, and let's let's <laughs> firing squad time. Let's do this. Uh, uh, did, did you want to put up that next slide? Yeah. There? And so this this is what, yep. And this is this is what we're proposing. We know we've got a, a, a good deal of feedback coming from you, so let's have it. So before we we open up the floor, I just wanted to, to do a little bit of scoping. Can we maybe like sorry. Th thanks. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so I think just to put a little bit of framing around the discussion here, um, especially around this validation question. Um, I think some of the earlier questions have established that, you know, the IETF is not going to define validation procedures here. The validation stuff is largely going to be outside of this. So um, I think the guidance, there's already a piece of feedback to the proponents here that, you know, that there's going to be a threshold question for doing any IETF work, that there there be some plausible process there. Um, you know, so, so before you come back and actually make a proposal to do work, like, you'll need to have a plausible proposal there. And so I think for the most part, let's consider, um, you know, Kind of stipulate that that's something to be done in the future and you know the, the focus of the ietf work here if there is any would be on kind of how to communicate and encode and talk about that validation which would be defined elsewhere with that um take it away ben campbell and i hope this is an easier question because you just put up a lot of scarier things after i thought about it um when you talk about short-lived certificates or short-lived tokens especially when you talk about very short-lived tokens but these things to me make sense when we're talking about the TLS world. But I wonder what you've thought about when we talk about mail that has a very different time horizon. Um, you know, conceivably things can take a few days to get from the sender to the receiver. That's not that's not common. But more commonly, I have at least 15 years of archives. Um, so, what is your expectation of what happens to old mail that has logos on it? when those certificates or or such have expired. Now, I'm assuming that the relying party is the MTA and it never looks at that mail again, which would make me assume these logos will continue to get displayed, but I don't know if that's the right thing, especially if one of them turned out to be malicious and that's why they were allowed to expire or revoked or something. Uh, on the other hand, I can see a world where all my old logos have gone away because they're expired and I'm not sure that's the right thing either. So I don't know the answer. I just want to make sure people are thinking about it. I mean, I, I think we all agree this is um, a problem that uh, is, is basically still open. I mean, we can think of mechanisms by which we can remediate some of these things. Um, you know, 
certs are long lived, for example, and they have like a revocation process if, you know, even if they're long lived, but that introduces a new set of problems or we can make them very short lived, but then, you know, we, we have a lot more in some sense work to do um, to, to basically refetch, refetch. Um, and so there's this trade off and I don't think we, and you know, this is one reason why we're here is to try to broaden the experience and then just try to see what's sort of the best way to do that. So. The, the only thing I'd add is that we've discussed that as a working group and we've come to no consensus on how to handle that. Max Palak, Cable Labs. Um, a couple of uh, considerations. Um, <clears throat> when you were comparing JWTs with X509 certificates, you notice that <clears throat> there's a completely set of support for the two types. This comes from the fact that, in my opinion, uh, one tries to assert identities, the other tries to give you permissions to do something. This is the way they were born, and <clears throat> usually the two in a good system are kept orthogonal. So you assert the identity and then you get your... So I don't see that to be something uh, one or the other. It would be probably more one and the other. Um, probably in the final technical solution, which I don't know exactly how that, that might be. The second thing is about, you know, discussion about validations, et cetera. Um, we deal with that <clears throat> all the time uh, in the sense that, you know, we have lots of vendors, et cetera, that wants to uh, put logos in, in our products or cable related uh, stuff. And we have very, very strict procedures for that. Uh, that means that, for example, uh, when you request a certificate, even if we validated you once, we continue to validate you and your rights to use that particular name every single time. It's a completely different environment than the web PKI, I understand that, but we are very strict on that. And it's true what, what Richard say is a policy decision. Uh, <clears throat> so PKI can come with policies and all the procedures related to the audits, et cetera, that doesn't mean it's the web trust audit. It means that if you, if you start your ecosystem for the mail purposes, right? For the mail, um, so validating mail, logos, et cetera. It could be a completely separate PKI uh, that might be trusted by browser and MTAs or, you know, is their choice, right? And as long as you define the good rules to validate these logos, for example, only accept trademark logos uh, and, um, you know, and add this very set uh, procedures, then <clears throat> then there there's, might be more trust to put for this particular purpose on that PKI. And that could be the one that goes into the MTAs and the MTAs trust to, uh, to show the logos because of the policy, not because of the technical details, but because of the policy. <clears throat> and this usually works well uh, in the sense that if you have a very controlled environment, everybody can apply for that, but the, it doesn't follow the same rules for the web trust. Um, as an example that I, that, I, that I give you is, we have completely different procedures for device certificate and code signing certificate. I would say this is a code signing certificate. So very valuable. Uh, it will cost more money, uh, because, but a, the procedures are needed to avoid all these, <clears throat> these, these issues that you might have, so. Thank you. I just wanted to point out regarding the um, first point um, about uh, basically identity versus um, authoriz authorization. Um, yes, I mean, there's um, some interesting work that we've seen that we've recently learned about. For example, the STIR uh, working group um, has some interesting models that we were, you know, looking, going to look at that in, in fact actually, you know, has some, in some sense a hybrid model, you know, th there's a range to, and then this is something that we hope to get as feedback as to what is sort of the right way to go forward. And this is partly just to point out that, you know, this is something that we would like help. Um, agreed also on your second point uh, that, yes, there's a, you know, a, a scope of governance choices. Um, and this is also something we would like to have discussion about uh, as to, you know, what is sort of the right approach for the governance. I mean, granted, some of these things are not necessarily ITF, uh, issues, but it's something we're very cognizant of, and you know, we we would like feedback basically about. Barry Liba, 
where are the logos stored? How are they conveyed uh, in the email and how are they retrieved? Um, sorry, I, I think I glanced over that in the uh, effort to be fast. They're basically uh, published HTTPS URLs that are SVGs and you can store that anywhere. There's no binding to the domain so that you can change that as you need to as long as the hash matches what's validated, it's the appropriate. Oh, that's also why we didn't feel the need for DNS sec on that because the certificate is stored somewhere else can be validated and you're looking for the hash, hashes to match. Then how do you avoid having each message have a unique URI for the logo? And that they're so, thereby defeating the caching and creating web bugs. So that's why our proposal publishes them in the DNS is so that you don't have to validate that on a per message basis. The mess okay. Right. The so, UR the URI is not in the message header. Correct. It's that's what's published in the DNS. That's what's in um, what we're calling an assertion record for BIMI. Right. And that way you can pull it and cache that. And that's on a per domain basis. And then when you receive a message from that domain, right, it can be completely okay. transparent. No one in the middle needs to be okay. wise as to what happened, what's happening. Got it. Right. Rich Sauls. So I just don't want to understand some of the trade offs for all of the parties involved. Mm -hmm. um, the large. This is, Corporations that aren't currently doing DMARC to protect their users from phishing will be incented because now they'll get their logo displayed. Is that? In the, get their logo properly displayed in the right place because, well, first of all, is that true? Is yes. that the incentive? Okay. So that users will then, a miracle will happen and users will learn or MTAs will reject non DMARC mail because it's posted. The right because the mail will not go through if there's no DMARC record. So the idea being that the logo is a good enough incentive, whereas not having your customers hurt is not a good incentive. It's not a good has not proven to be a good enough incentive. It, it's not working. Even it's with not. Tanks. I get it. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, the only way to make that work, it seems, is you need a globally a global level playing field, legal regime of intellectual property. Is that correct? Do you know of one? <laughs> That's my point. I know of one instance where it was been tried so far, uh, the ICANN domain, top level domain trademark resolution policy. Um, anyone who's got $100,000 can join. Uh, okay, uh, great. Let's let's you guys solve that problem first, and then come back. <laughs> yeah, right. How many countries are signatures to the UN? Uh, John Peterson, I do some of that stir stuff that you were talking about. I guess I found yeah. The, I, mean, I mean, I was coming up here to talk about that kind of distinction between the the cert and the jot, and we we obviously in the stir work we kind of we generate these jots not to serve the same kind of purpose as a cert, right? It, it seemed the way you presented it kind of like an apples and oranges. Um, conversation because certs are intended to be very long-lived identifiers used to sign and attest things and the job is like the kind of thing that gets signed by them on like a per call or per attestation basis right and I, I mean I guess when I was listening to the conversation I kind of assumed that the cert then would be where the logo lives and that whoever the certificate authority was would be the one attesting the logo but I guess that's not right it's well so what, what's in the DNS then that you get because so, so the the original intent was you publish the logo and then you could have any number of different validations, some of which don't use a certificate or what have you, so that it was a uniform mechanism, no, regardless of validation type. Uh, through the certificate that Wei proposed, the logo is also in the certificate. Okay. Uh, and it needs to be there for transparency. And so the hook in the DNS would point to the certificate or what points to the certificate? Yes. Yeah, okay. the, the DNS would reference the logo and the and the certificate. Okay, so a couple of points about that. One is in terms of the web bug, speaking also as a bit of a DNS provider, mm -hmm. I hear some DNS people like to track users too, and that yeah. querying that doesn't actually obviate any of the concerns that we have about mm -hmm. these things hitting websites. It just changes who's gonna be able to mine your data. I also, again, I, I think I'm interested in things like this for Stir, right? 
And I, I believe that there are a couple of probable solvable problem spaces, uh, solvable problem spaces that are in this, like actual winnable games. But doing this all is one big thing that is like linking in certificates and email and the DNS and like all this WIPO kind of stuff um, is what's really over the top. I'll, I'll just, you know, and I'd be happy to talk to you guys about ways mm -hmm. to chop this up into things that might be more modular, potentially solvable in some small areas. Also, have you guys actually looked at WIPO at their global intellectual property database that like actually has like logo listings that are registered in it? And yeah. here, wait, it's the uh, UN Mike, so and it's the people that do like international trademark stuff. Like it's. I mean, WIPO. Thing. My understanding to it is that it it provides a means to do registration across many different jurisdictions simultaneously. It, however, itself doesn't. I think assert a certain uh, uh, it's effectively legal registration. It depends on other member countries to do that for it. Right. So, I mean, under, it can under, help like identify a, things. Under a UN but, treaty, but it, it, right? It's a yeah, yeah. UN treaty that yes, yes, yes. That, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it, I mean, it's an international treaty. I've, I forget the details if it's through the UN, or it might have actually pre-existed actually before the UN. I don't don't remember the details. Yeah. But, but the thing is, the registrations, it has, it simply identifies the registration, but it references other things that become the sort of legal home for those things. Okay. Hello, David Skenazi. Uh, first, uh, clarifying question. So in the, maybe I missed something because I'm a little confused. At the beginning of the talk, you mentioned that the you, you weren't planning on the user behaving differently uh, with this image. Um, so if, like, the, how the image looks in there is not aimed at having the user react to it and change their security behavior. What's the benefit of signing it? Why why not just have a system that puts an image uh, like similar to how fav icons work? I think um, so. So the problem with favicon is several fold, but I mean the most important one is anyone can put up whatever favicon they want. Mm -hmm. And I can pretend I am um, like MasterCard or something. Why is that bad? Um, because users really trust what they see. Wait, wait, no. So, 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 uh, actually, they trust what they see, and then they do what happens with that trust. Do they act on that trust? Um, so it's probably a very reasonable thing as long as I am, in fact, MasterCard. And that's what a lot of this is about. So j just to clarify my understanding. So let's say I'm not MasterCard and I send you, I send a user an email pretending to be MasterCard. I have a phishing domain and I have a logo that looks like MasterCard. Um, are you saying that this proposal prevents them from or makes it less likely that they'll click on the phishing link? Because you seemed to, you said that that was out of scope and not what you wanted to do with this at the beginning. So, like, I'm, I, I'm just missing the whole point of why are these validated? If it doesn't change anything, that they're not. Oh, oh so it's, it's just sort of like this double negative, I guess. So what we don't want to do, because um, there's academic research showing this, is that if users see something they, you know, some set of users are in fact going to trust that logo um, and, and you know, go click on that link and all of that sort of stuff. However, I think what you're asking is, do these things provide some sort of positive security that users in fact really could, should always go look for these things? And actually the research has shown, no, they don't really pay attention in the general case to these. So, okay, no, thanks, that is very helpful. Uh, so then, what is the positive value out of this? You want to the mic. So my understanding there would be some entity that will uh, do validation of images. You cannot, it's not going to fetch image just from your domain. Uh, so no, I'm, sorry, I'm not asking how it works. I'm asking what does this give me as a user? If you are a phishing site publishing image of MasterCard from your domain, then it wouldn't display if, if the system works properly. 
So, right, unless you you uh, unless somebody vouch for it. Okay, uh, and that image not displaying. What's the benefit? Sorry, I'm trying to tease this apart okay, because well, that the first slide said that the benefit was not to have users click on phishing or not. Like it, that was on one of the first slides. I, I thought that was the benefit. That's what I assumed when I walked into the room. That it was to help prevent attacks like phishing. But that was a non-goal, so I'm asking what the benefit so, is. So, so the, the benefit was specifically about authentication with domain alignment, with DMARC. And it's specifically yeah. that. Sorry, yeah. as a user. Like so the, as a user with, that doesn't know what the word authentication means. Right. And so the, the, the whole point is for those things never to make it to a user, right? Not about, we're, mm -hmm. we're specifically not talking about users in an, in an inbox because one, there's no meaningful data here, right? Uh, specifically with an email. Two, there are a bunch of security studies that show the presence or absence of logos, like the, like the, uh, what's it, the URL. lock? Yeah, like the URL. Right? But don't actually make a difference to how people okay. do it, right? If this is purely in the mechanisms yeah. from A to B mm -hmm. to get things authenticated. Uh, that's yeah. Let me try to do more user use. Okay, so I mean, okay, yeah, I, I was always, when I said user, I always thought recipient. That's so, mm -hmm. the, their point here is that if you have a DMARC policy that has reject or, qu or quarantine, messages that purport to be from you but aren't will not be delivered. Mm -hmm. The incentive to do that is that you will put your logo in front of the user. So the benefit that the benefit that the user gets is that the bogus mails don't get to them. The benefit that the signer gets is that the user gets to see their logo. The point, their point is that the user seeing the logo is a benefit to the sender, not to the user. Okay. The the junk the junk mail not getting there is the incentive to the sender. That's the point. So to the, to the user. So let me rephrase that because I think I'm starting to have a vision of the benefit here mm -hmm. where there is no direct benefit to the receiver, but this is kind of a carrot that you dangle in front of providers so they actually deploy DMARC, and then if DMARC gets deployed, that benefits receivers worldwide. Yeah. No, sorry, uh, the f human re e yeah. email reader. Um, so is that a summary of the benefit of this approach, of, yes. the, of the goals you're trying to accomplish. Yes. Okay. Um, th okay, that was my clarifying question. Uh, now I have an opinion, which is, <laughs> and especially aimed at ITF leadership, um, this goal and benefit seems incredibly limited to me. And the problems you've like done a really good job of describing in these studies and all these things like sound incredibly hard, not to mention very likely impossible. So the cost here in the ITF would be high. I see a lot of very smart people in this room who are spending a lot of time for this, a lot of smart people on the mailing list. So my ask is please, please do not continue this work in the ITF. The, the, the benefits are not worth the cost. Our community could spend their time on something else. Wendy, nobody said W3C yet. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't going to either, but Wendy Seltzer. Uh, and uh, I guess, I, sort of following up on David's point, I, I was sitting having a very difficult time figuring out what a mail user agent would be doing for its end user, the mail reader, uh, because I don't know a lot of uh, end user mail recipients who say, I want more logos in my inbox. Uh, and, uh, but I, I, so why would, you know, ma mail readers uh, be doing this for their users? And there, you today. Well, the mic. <laughs> there are already a number of implementations of this today that already exist. I mean, it's this is not the first time. We're not proposing this as a new thing. I mean, they already exist today. I mean, I can pull out my phone and show you. I have a pile of logos in my inbox from from a mail provider. Uh, so, does that sort of answer your? I mean, I don't know if it becomes a competition thing to say like, oh, 
you know, now Apple needs it, Thunderbird needs it, those sorts of things. I don't know if that's true, but I mean, they do already exist today. And so part of the solution that we would like is to make it so that each of these providers don't have their own silo of logos and information and, and validation, et cetera. Okay, and then uh, my other point, uh, as a lawyer, and perhaps uh, I don't know if there are other lawyers in the room, but the collection of trademark uh, problems that, that you identified uh, has tangled uh, the crowd over at ICANN and the trademark clearinghouse uh, in knots for years and years and hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, and uh, so I would uh, advise that bringing that problem into this space uh, is not going to help us to, to make progress. Yeah. <laughs> so Dave, I know you're waiting on the mic. You're after Martin, who is... Oh, I thought yes, he was there. You showed up. You showed up just before he did. Oh, oh. Um, at the sake of sounding like a broken record, um, Martin Thompson. I, no, I heard that before. Um, <laughs> the the questions that you sort of look at when you come into working in, into a boff like this is um, you're looking to see that there's a group of people who are interested in doing the work. That seems reasonably well understood. That the work is possible, and I snag on that point. Um, I think we've seen that here, and we've we've got one one worked use case or example of a system like this that works, sort of mostly. People don't like it very much, etc. Um, and that's the web PKI, and that's incredibly difficult, and that was incredibly expensive to get get going. I'm not personally convinced, based on what I've seen here, that um, that is possible to replicate in a system that is far more complicated and nuanced and difficult. Logos are much more difficult than names, and let me tell you, names are hard enough. Um, so my advice to you is if that you want to continue this work, um, there's a lot of work to be done in building the case for um, convincing people, these people in this room and probably the community at large, that what you're doing is possible. And when I say possible, I mean you're going to ship it and people are going to believe it and you're not going to be subject to, to fishing. And I don't think there's any expectation there's a ridiculously high standard here for, for any of this. Uh, if the PayPal um, Pandora thing isn't addressed, then I think we... We, we might say that, oh, well, that's that's an, a remarkably good system that we're now worrying about that particular aspect of, of the problem. But we've got such a long way to go before we get to that point. And the confusable problems, the trademark disputes, the whole system of establishing who owns what and all of that business is so fraught that if you come back and have another boff and we're having this discussion, and people are being convinced, I'll be surprised, but you know, also kind of <coughs> impressed at the same time. So you've got your work cut out for you. All right, we have Dave Crocker on the remote line. Hi there. So the, the, um, the topic of intellectual property is being mentioned a lot and generally uh, being mentioned in a, a way that acknowledges how challenging it is. I wanna underscore that. Uh, and then feed it into what's showing on the slide. <clears throat> um, a little over 20 years ago, I was on a pre-ICANN committee tasked with proposing some new top-level domains. Uh, the committee effort itself failed, although it proposed things like the UDRP, registry, registrar, uh, uh, terminology, and a couple of other things, GTLD terms. <clears throat> At the beginning of that committee, the committee had uh, roughly half bureaucrats and, and uh, uh, intellectual property lawyers and half internet geeks. And at the beginning of the um, uh, work, um, the WTO, sorry, WIPO uh, representative, who was an intellectual property attorney, uh, got up and said that we could solve uh, the, the name conflict issue by using international trademarks. And uh, I uh, naively or supposedly naively asked, uh, oh, do those already exist? And he said, well, no, but we've been talking about them. And I said, well, for how long? And he said, 100 years. Um, the, this space is one known to be uh, not just not solved, but have no real 
uh, future that shows it's going to be solved. And yet it is at the crux of the BME work uh, if we're going to get scalable solutions. And so while the partitioning and uh, deferral uh, of uh, that shows in the validation bullet or half bullet um, makes sense in general, we need to be careful that the ITF doesn't participate in its narrow work uh, in building a house of cards that is missing cards and won't get them anytime soon. Thank you. Yeah, Ryark. So um, I, I think this discussion about the, 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 the costs and benefits is, is, is um, potentially a key for for this effort or an approach to think about that would, would be um, useful. And I, I, I guess I'm joining the list of people who are calling for, you know, please figure out what, you know, the high, high level business legal jurisdiction thing is uh, be, before you do the protocol design. At this point, it seems a little bit early. So I, and, and I, I don't want to uh, so, um, discourage anybody, and and I, you know, the world is taken forward by people who actually think about new things and uh, design new structures. And maybe we need something in this space. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, maybe you can design it. Maybe not. But but I I think that's the that is the step one. Like you figure out the high level design, uh, not not the protocol design, but the but the the business and legal legal parts. Uh, if you have an answer for that, and and I might be also surprised. As, as, as others, if, if, if we find an answer to that, that would be great. But let's do that first and then, then come back if you have an answer. Um, and and there, there's, I mean, it's actually an interesting problem. I, I, I would like, <laughs> rather think about that than, the, than some of the protocol details and certificates and such. And there are also many pitfalls there in addition to, to everything that's been uh, discussed. You could um, fa fail in multiple different ways. You could, uh, for instance, try to have something that's um, that, that you know that, that that's uh, favoring too many large entities as opposed to the the, the long tail. Um, you could have uh, uh, you could try and build something out of lo local context and and uh, globalize it, but not not really understand that that does, doesn't actually isn't actually possible in that sense. Um, or you could have something that you can make work, but it would rely on some assumptions about like. Uh, our um, systems being able to recognize like where people are and what, what they're doing and who they are better than they do today. Just as an example, like I, I still get miles, not kilometers, when I uh, use Google Maps. And you know, I probably told Google Maps 17,000 times that I, I want kilometers. So if that's its concept of you know, where I am and what jurisdiction I'm, I'm in, you know, that's not a good sign for something more uh, fine-grained. And that, that might actually be required. So try to figure out what the what, what the assumptions are for, for things to actually work. Thank you. Uh, Wes Hertiker, ISI again. Um, first off, there's elements of this I actually really want to work. Um, there's, I, I would love for DMARC to be stronger and for more people to use it. Uh, I think that would be fantastic. Uh, I love icons. Um, way back in the early, late, late 80s, early 90s, I forget exactly when I created an X-Face header, which was like, you know, the first instantiation of this kind of stuff. And later came P-Icons, uh, and I, I wrote P-Icon interfaces for two mailers because one wasn't enough. And then Gravatars and it snowballed, which means you also have to look out for conflicts and that kind of stuff. But it finally sort of dawned on me a bit ago that I think to a large extent, uh, back up one sec, so the IETF, we try to solve technical issues, right? So um, as Pete nicely put a minute ago, what's the benefit to the receiver and the sender? Where, where is the problem between those two that we are fixing with a solution? And the problem as I see it is that you actually have a business case that you're actually trying to put forth, right? Because the reality is the, the carrot that you're using is entirely business incentive, right? There's no security attached to it. You've, you've stated that. There's no desire to do anti-phishing or anything. So the purpose of displaying an EV cert thing goes away because web browsers would never display an EV cert symbol for, for a non-EV cert. That would, like, shoot them. And the, But on this half, there is nothing to de-incentivize a mail reader from forming a business relationship to display a logo anyway. 
right? All, your entire mechanism can be circumvented with cash, right? A company can come forward and say, you know, mail reader, I want I want to pay you to put my logo there anyway. I don't I don't want to go through DMARC. I don't want to you know do everything else. I just want to give you cash. And I bet you that most people would take it, right? Because there's no de-incentive for them not to display the logo. It's entirely a business relationship. This greatly eases that business relationship because now there's a mechanism for you to publish it in one location as opposed to every company having to go to multiple locations to get their logo displayed. So the, the discrepancy here is that the ATF is very focused on a technical solution, and yet this is, t this is tying a business solution to a technical solution, and uh, that has historically not fared well, unfortunately. All right, Stephen Farrell, uh, I'll try not to be repetitive. Uh, I don't think anybody said it explicitly. As a user, I would not like this. I would rather not have this, and I don't want my mail user agents to start adding this and then not to have a checkbox to turn it off. Um, so that's, I don't think that anybody had said that, but I'd just like to say it. Aren't you still using Pine? I'm just... No, no, I use... <laughs> <laughs> I use Thunderbird, but no. I, but nonetheless, regardless of what you say, I don't, I don't want it personally. So uh, there's a data point there that not all users will want this kind of thing. In fact, I think we... You know, I don't know. Uh, so I think, we're on again, back to the web book thing, you have an implicit kind of assumption that if you, even if your MTA, your inbound MTA did cache this logo for you, uh, Ben's point about opening up old emails kind of means that they have to keep a binding between that URL and the original one forever. It seems kind of somewhat unrealistic. And my last point is, thank you for at least not including the blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> We have more slides. <laughs> Legit. Bron Gondwana. Um, I've been putting together a summary of what I thought everyone's been saying here, that the goal for the sender is to get the brand logo, logo displayed in front of the end user. They will make an effort for that. Goal for the mailbox provider is to get more signed email and upgrade the ecosystem. So they, they will accept this to get that result. For the end user, the goal is that they get less fraudulent email, and I think that's probably the least well-defined out of this, mm -hmm. given that you can fake Outlook.com, given that the brand identifier is not going to be recognized anyway, Outlook with a zero in it or whatever instead. Um, again, I think the end user probably gets the least value out of this, and we've got a room full of yes. a lot of people who end user is their main, I mm -hmm. guess, experience with this rather than being a sender or a mailbox provider. Um, so obviously to anyone in the end user position, this doesn't look particularly valuable. I guess my question is, is the work going to happen somewhere else if it doesn't happen here? Which bits would the IATF prefer to have a finger in the pie of uh, rather than have it happen without the IATF? And I think that's probably what we need to solve in the room today. Thank you, Ron. I think I'm in strong agreement with what you just said. Uh, Max Pala Cable Labs. Um, it seems that from what I heard on the, and I don't want to do your job summarizing anything, but <clears throat> One of the big things that is brought here is the value, right? Um, maybe, and this is just a suggestion, I don't want to, <laughs> don't scream at me, okay? And this goes for everybody in the room. <laughs> uh, maybe you could try to test as actually adding value like security, for example, like if you uh, to take this as a business, business requirement that you have, combine that with something that is really valuable for the ITF, maybe increment the, the security of email. What about <laughs> what about if we do an experiment where we use certificate with logo, so we don't have to write specification initially. Um, you <clears throat> you have your mail server signing the emails that you want, you know, in this experiment that you want the user to visualize with the logos. Um, that might be a way to to understand. First of all, how um, users might <clears throat> might respond to that, and you can collaborate with some open source software to see how to integrate this display, which should not be in the body of the email, of course, in a dedicated uh, indicator, because otherwise it would be spoofable with HTML. Um, once you do that, then you might think about, I added this value for my business and the security now, uh, because I increment the use of s mine, for example. Um, this is, this can be seen by this community very well. 
uh, in the sense that we're all about trying to improve the security or the privacy of, of, of the users across the internet. And this could be, uh, um, you know, I work in the past in the email actually <laughs> uh, with the company, with you guys, and uh, that's, that's what we were trying to do, right? To have more uh, secure email. This is, this will be great. And I would suggest that you look into this combine using the business requirement you have to finally uh, be try to deploy this new uh, certificate or security in the S mine uh, for the large majority of your users. That would be amazing, and I would love that. But I fortunately I don't think that this is the right way to do it. Um, not nothing about technical, but mm, just not combining this added value. Um, try to, to do that, and I think that this community will be a lot more open um, to discuss also your business case, I think. So we have about 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna go ahead and close the line after Jeffrey. Hello, David Skenazi again. Um, so just to touch on one of the points we talked about before, um, when I came up, we you agreed that this does not stop phishing. Uh, and with that, Agreeing on that point, we said that, okay, this has benefits, and in my opinion, those benefits were limited. Since then, I've been to brandindicators.org, which I think is related to your effort, and on the first page of why brand indicators, it says, stop phishing. So I now change my assessment of like not very great to actively harmful. I think this brings a sense of false security and is actually harmful to the ecosystem as a whole. Um, my points earlier about asking for this work to not continue in the ITF still hold. Jeffrey Yaskin, um, I've heard concerns earlier um, that uh, mail agents will, will display the logo without requiring DMARC um, because they get paid or, or whatever, because there's no technical reason to, to tie those. Um, for the existing systems that are showing logos, do you know if they are requiring DMARC in order to do so? Uh, it's exceptionally haphazard. I don't know of, uh, I, if Neil can speak for his system, for the other ones, I'm pretty certain there is not a strong requirement. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. 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 yeah it, it's, it's super haphazard. They're sourced from random places. Like, it, it's... I think you're it's, talking about the logo display, though. Yeah, the, the, the logo display is, isn't is connected to anything in certain cases. Right? There are definitely places where it's like, they'll just go to the Twitter for the domain name and pull the logo, and it just works. And that that should be really frightening. And that's one of the things we're deeply trying to address with this. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, go ahead. So, so one last question to mm -hmm. that Florian Strand MPI. So how would the end user be able to decide if the logo is actually being verified or it's one of these other systems that does not verify anything at all? Uh, so, so you need another certification for the mail provider too? Do you want to take that one? You so, 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 so the, the the short answer to that is right now, logos are coming from all sorts of different places. And the point of this is to say, let's stop doing this in a haphazard way. And let's make sure we use a source and that source is validated. And we know it's tied to the message being authenticated. And you think yeah. all the other providers will change and stop their systems to exist right now? No, of course not. But this builds over time and adds value. And there is a, a clear path to this doing a lot more good. The short term is clearly fragmented. That's why we're here talking about figuring out a way to do it in a, in a standard manner. But your, your point is accurate, right? Like that that's exactly the, that's the short term adoption problem. But adoption- so will not go away on the long term. We see it with IPv6. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, so uh, we are just a couple minutes left from the end of our slot. Um, this is a BOF, but it is not a working group forming BOF. It's, I would call it a more feedback collection BOF. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not gonna ask the typical BOF questions, but let me ask the proponents here, like are, you know, you've gotten a lot of feedback. Are there any things that, you know, you were hoping to cover that you didn't cover and you'd like to bring up in the last couple minutes? 
No, I, I think we covered um, what we covered. We covered the problems. We got some new ones, and that that's <laughs> that's why we're here, right? We 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 understand we don't have a perfect understanding of the problem space, and this has been very very helpful. And you know, we that's we what. See them again. Yeah. <laughs> Well, as I think Martin said, the second buff will either be uh, <laughs> a surprise or uh, really interesting. But no, this this is <laughs> this is why we're here is for this feedback, and we thank you all for participating. And also, we got one final question, or is that two, Barry? <laughs> no, it's just a just a comment. Um, as a user, um, differently from. <laughs> yeah. um, I would like to have something that adds security, and if it comes with a logo, and you figure out, you know, the trademark, etc., as as we say, not here. I would be happy with, to have something. So I would not discourage you to not do it, uh, but not do it in this way. Um, I would try to look look in your business case if there's the case for really adding real security. Uh, as you know, the indication on the website says, you know, we would like sure. to to add some security. It might not block spam, spam at all, uh, at all, or it might just have some indication. But for example, strong authentication messages allow MTAs to do like a little bit better choices when they allow you to display the message or not, etc. So please don't don't take the feedback that you get from here and say like. Take this work, do it everywhere else, and you know we we hate you for this. No, 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 no. This is not what we want to have. We want to have some more security. So if we can manage to put in there, that would be great. So I hope that the second buff, or you know, if we want to, it's not my area of work right now, but I can I can try to help if I can, um, and I'll be happy to to discuss this yeah. further. I was just the website is not related to the working group, and we agree uh, that language is not helpful. So, so Max, you. I, I sorry, take out oh, there. You are. Um, I take it that means that you think some version of this at some point might be reasonable work for the IETF. So, the question. Go ahead, Stephen. <laughs> sorry, Barry, I just I think it's ambiguous because I mean Max, I think was asking for no version of this. Right. I said it's something. Okay, never mind. <laughs> then let's then let's ask the, que the the two questions I have, and and they're not going to be. I'll, I'll I'll do it as a hum. Why not? But it's not going to be binary hums. They're going to be unary hums. Who thinks that this or some variant of it that they might come back with is suitable for the IETF to work on? Hum. Hum. <laughs> Got a little bit of hum, and Max has a comment. So let me give you the microphone. When you say some form of this, you mean can be completely different technically, no. or something similar, something they might come back with next time. Very, very. I, I doubt that it would be totally different. But I'm not going to speak for them. So I, I think I have the answer. We we basically had a non-hum on that. Mm -hmm. um, do if if you think they should work on this for a while and decide what to change and come back for another boff at some point. Um, okay. So what I get from that is don't give up, but it needs drastic changes. Mm -hmm. So thanks. Thank you, Barry. <laughs> and thank you everyone for having this conversation. Sure. And there, 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 there is a mailing list. Uh, what was that? Yes. All right. Thank you, everyone. I think thank you. that's the end of our business. We're adjourned. It's, it, it's in all the... It's there.
I need to talk to Jim Shad for a little bit, but um, it might take a few minutes. But I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll try to raise maybe a time I can talk to him. No, 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 talk with him, talk with him. No, no, no. I, I need to talk to him on some eight and one point thing, so it could take a while. That's only I mean, let me let me arrange a time to talk to him then. Uh, I'll be back. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah.